Welcome to the Mac Talks, everybody. I am your host, Scott Johnson, president of the Mac Media Group Digital Marketing Agency located here in Brookfield, Connecticut. This guy across from me is my co-host, Chase Hutchison. Hi, guys. Chase, quickly tell everybody and our guests what our program is all about. So as always, if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or impactful leader, the Mac Talks are the vehicle that bring you the stories that you need to hear. Damn right. And today, we've got a great guest, as always. I'm super excited to uh, to pick his brain and to, to get him on the program. So Chase, why don't you go ahead and uh, intro our guest? All right, so a wise man once told me that uh, the true definition of an entrepreneur is someone who can grow and evolve. Um, and if that's the case, and that's the definition we're going by, then David Meltzer is the perfect embodiment of entrepreneur. Uh, he's the current CEO of Sports One Marketing, S1 Media House. He's an award-winning humanitarian, the host of the Playbook Podcast, a best-selling author, and an award-winning inspirational speaker. With 25 years of experience as an entrepreneur and executive in the legal, technology, sports, and entertainment fields under his belt, he continues his mission to make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. To further that mission, he's, his newest book released, Game Time Decision Making, high-scoring business strategies from the biggest names in sports, offers a playbook to making business decisions with the same confidence and clarity as the world's best coaches. David, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's awesome to have you. How you doing? Oh, it's awesome to be here. I'm excited to wrap it up with the Mac guys. So let's do this. Awesome, awesome. man. That's great. That's great. Um, so yeah, let's just kind of jump in um, and kind of talk about your entrepreneurial story. So I mean, we've watched you speak on you know TED Talks and a lot of your stuff. Um, you have an amazing story. Um, it's kind of amazing how you've kind of, like what he said, evolved throughout the years. You were in a lot of different things. You've had ups, you've had downs. Um, so tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial story, if you could. Yeah, you know, for me, it was always having the perspective of that the universe would clothe my imagination. So I never could limit my point of entry. And uh, my journey was really purposeful, the first half of my journey, just to be rich. Uh, grew up with six kids, five boys and a girl, single mom. Only time I wasn't happy, you know, we had a two bedroom apartment. My mom worked two jobs. She was a second grade teacher and filled up turnstiles at the 7 Elevens and Lawson's, the convenience stores, and yeah. packed our dinners in the car peanut butter and jelly or uh, bologna with mustard, whatever it was. But I was super happy. Only time I wasn't happy was when I caught her crying over financial stress. You know, car would break down, dishwasher, couldn't go to summer camp. And my mom would cry yep. and I still get choked up over it because she sacrificed so much. And I just in my mind said, you know what, I'm going to buy my mom a house in a car. I was five years old. I said, I'm going to be a millionaire. And if I'm a millionaire, I can buy my mom a house, a car and retire myself. Uh, you know, that's what I figured a million dollars would do back then. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I just believed, uh, you know, that with uh, at that time, you know, working hard, working smart and i also had a perspective of working long i, I wasn't afraid of waiting you know until uh, my mom she wanted me you know doctor lawyer or failure i wanted to be a professional football player at five so i wasn't afraid to wait till i was 22 to be a millionaire and do every single thing i could to pursue my potential as a football player um i actually ended up going to college and playing football oh wow i didn't know that yeah uh, my dreams died of an NFL star my very first play my freshman year when Christian Okoye literally ran me over. <laughs> <laughs> he stepped on my chest. Uh, I, I took a little pride later on in my career to know that he was AFC player of the year. But uh, I realized then as I lied on my back, you know, doctor, lawyer, failure. I went the doctor route uh, until my brother told me doctors had to be in hospitals and I hated hospitals. But at that time, my brother gave me the best entrepreneur advice of my life. He didn't know it, but he told yep. me to be more interested than interesting. And, hmm. you know, I kind of skirted through everything but football. I had skirted through being more interesting. You know, I yeah. just was hyper intelligent when it came to school. It wasn't hard. I just wasn't interested. Yeah. And when I realized that I was 18 years old, pre-med at a great college, I wasn't going to be an NFL star. And I literally almost ended up in med school when I hate hospitals. I mean, it is the worst. I, I just thought I could be a sports doctor and be on fields and training rooms. And I had no idea that you had to get because to I wasn't interested. Yeah. Right. I, yep. I was just good at school. So who, why should I be interested in what a doctor actually does? Yeah. You know, and I think that's the problem with being an entrepreneur. You know, people are on this surface level of wanting to make a lot of money and be free 
and of their own choices. You know, I just had a couple entrepreneurs in here and, you know, they've raised the second round already. They're a multi-million dollar company, you know, and they're still broke, right? Yeah. They, yep. They're still on the journey. Uh, and so I, I then, cool enough though, uh, I became more interested, really interested, and I chose to go to law school um, to be rich. Yep. And I chose the law school I chose because I actually re-engineered, reverse engineered what the highest paid job out of law school was. I found out it was oil and gas litigator. I found out Tulane University had the best oil and gas program because they taught civil and common law. Yep. And I went to that law school, although my mom thought it was the party, I went there to be rich, <laughs> to be an oil and gas litigator. Yeah. Um, then, you know, because I uh, was more interested than interesting, I ended up getting two job offers. Yeah. One to be an entrepreneur, sell legal research online for West Publishing, and the other was to be an oil and gas litigator. I then took, despite second lesson, my mom's advice, mm -hmm. I took the job in the internet. My yep. mom actually told me the internet was a fad <laughs> and that if I didn't take the law job, I was a, <laughs> I was a waste. Yeah. Like, literally, I was the failure uh, because I took the job in the internet. And she was so worried about me. But the lesson I learned, which is huge, beyond being more interested than interesting, which includes being of service and asking for help, I learned when I graduated that you cannot put faith in what other people want for you. You yep. can't you, you, literally, no matter how much they love you, we call these people family and friends. You cannot put faith in what they want for you. You can take their advice yep. and keep the advice that you, you align with, but don't put faith in what they want for you. You put faith in what you want for yourself. And I then taking the same philosophy, I became a millionaire nine months out of law school. Now, wow, let me amazing. explain why, because it's very entrepreneurial. I focused on acceleration and growth. I had a job that was supposed to pay $250,000 at plan, which was a great job, which is why I took the job. Yep. But it also, I knew one thing. I, I never had a real job. I was out of law school. Two, I didn't have a territory filled with relationships. So how was I going to go ahead and hit my number? Well, I knew one thing that most of the guys that were 50 years old in my job, they, they were working at most eight hours a day productively, yep. eight hours. So I made it my focus that I was going to work 16 hours a day productively. Okay. Then I said to myself, I'm going to be twice as efficient with my time. So with that time, I'm going to now work 32 hours of productivity. Then on top of that, I was going to be more statistically successful than them. But I knew I wasn't as good as them. So what I did is if on average they were taking 10 meetings a week, I was going to take 40 meetings a week. Okay. Therefore, I could be half as statistically successful and still sell twice as much, mm -hmm. which would give me 64 hours of productivity. Then what I did is I said, those guys only work five days. I'm going to work seven days. So if I'm working 64 hours of productivity, that's eight days a week times seven days I was working 50 day, 56 days a week. Wow. So even though I became a millionaire in nine months, I actually, I figured it out. I worked 10 years in nine months compared to the average wow. rep of, yeah. of productivity. Yeah. And so basically I was nowhere close to the comp plan because I only was at a hundred grand for 10 years. I made a million dollars. And that was a real great secret to success of being an entrepreneur was learning how to beat that efficiency, effectiveness, and statistical success. And I carried myself and branded myself into the Silicon Valley after we sold, the first company I worked for, we sold for $3.4 billion in 1995, which put me on a different trajectory, which I leveraged into the Silicon Valley, raised millions and millions of dollars for a wireless proxy server company, branded and leveraged myself into being the CEO of the world's first smartphone, the PCE phone. Remember, I have no technology background. Talk yeah. about clothing. <laughs> you clothe your ideas, yep. right? But I'll tell you what I always did. I never attached to an outcome. I focused in on the acceleration and growth, knowing that if all I focused in on was what I was supposed to do better, efficiently, effectively, and statistically successful. I do a lot of business coaching now and executive coaching. I got a kid that works for one of the big four or whatever they call themselves now. And he said, <laughs> I want to be the youngest partner I want to make it to partner faster than anyone at this big firm. I said, stop. That's not, that's not what you want. Yep. I said, what you want to do is bring as much rain in and work as efficiently as you can, because then they're going to offer you partner. Yeah. Where and it happens, it happens. Yeah. Old, yep. we, had, we, had our, we had our call this weekend and he did over a million dollars of business from Tuesday to Friday last week. And they're talking partner to him. Nice. And I told him, 
doesn't that feel better than telling everybody you're going to be the youngest partner and attaching to an outcome without doing what it actually takes to be partner? Yeah. No, that's awesome. That's true. I mean, it's a really good point. So, yeah. yeah so, so, I mean, it's you've had a roller coaster of a ride, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. I well, love the roller it, man. coaster the, happened when I lost it all. That's the real roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. T touch on that. Touch on that a little bit if you could. Yeah, so there I was, CEO of the you know the world's first smartphone, a Windows CE device, working with Microsoft and Samsung, and incredible experience. Uh, and then I lost all that I was raised on. You know, my mom taught me to live in gratitude. She taught me to. I mean, she wouldn't even let me come down in the morning if I didn't have a gracious attitude. She sent me back to my room. She made me say thank you at night. Uh, That's forgiveness. great. Forgiveness. Yeah. I, I was a forgiving person. My mom, you know, the humility that my mother had and forgave. You know, even my father, who she never talked negatively about, who was, you know, not the best dad, let alone he's probably one of the worst husbands you could imagine. Mm -hmm. And then accountability. My mom had this rule. All you do is ask yourself, what did I do to attract this to myself? And what am I supposed to learn from it? She would say life is only about lessons. Yep. I've later learned that the lessons keep on coming until we learn them. And you're going to get pain in between until you learn the lesson. And more importantly, you'll forget every lesson that you ever learned almost every day. So just rely on the power that you have to remember the lessons. Anyway, I surrounded myself with the wrong ideas, surrounded myself with the wrong people. I forgot about my gratitude, empathy, and accountability. I forgot that I was connected to the highest source ever of power and enlightenment and inspiration and literally went down a terrible spiral. Uh, and two years before I lost everything, you know, I had several warnings. My dad warned me that I was just like him, that I was going to be the richest man in the cemetery. He gave me a jacket with no pockets to remind me to hang in my closet wow. that I couldn't take anything with me. Yep. I had my best friend tell me he didn't like anyone I was hanging out with, and I lied to him. I'm like, I'm not doing what they're doing. He goes, you can lie to me, but don't lie to yourself. And then the ultimate thing happened. My wife threatened to leave me, uh, and I've known my wife since the fourth grade. I outkicked my coverage beyond belief. Yeah. And I talk about scared straight. I can do the TV show scared straight. My five foot gorgeous, wonderful wife scared me straight and told me that <laughs> unless I changed who I was, then I better get used to being lonely and poor because she was going to leave and she was going to make sure she left with everything I had. And weirdest thing in my life is I went through a quantum shift, the transformation as an entrepreneur two years before I lost everything. So most people bottom out economically and then make a shift. Yeah. I was on a serious upturn spiritually and inspirationally when I lost everything. It was almost as if I was preparing myself to handle the greatest lesson of all time, which was to lose over a hundred million dollars yeah. and be able to turn it around extremely quickly with passion and purpose and illuminate what I did so other people can learn from my lessons. And, you know, I, I, I try to be vulnerable is, is what they say, right? But I'm invulnerable because all I do is try to live as close to the truth that I can so other people can feel comfortable learning. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's awesome. And I imagine that that series that you underwent or uh, endured where you lost everything and then kind of built yourself back, that's what put you on the path towards public speaking, right? I mean, you got to basically you went and underwent all this pain and you found some sort of truth at the end of it. And now you're you want to bring that and share that with the rest of the world. Yeah. And I started just within my own company, you know, partnering with Warren Moon and, you know, having Sports One Marketing. I would do trainings every Friday. And my general counsel said, hey, man, you got to write a book about this because you're touching these kids. You're touching these employees. You're changing their lives. And through that motivation, then the book came out and then people said, hey, can you come to my school? You know, when I started speaking, I spoke 100 days my first year and I barely, you know, I traded sometimes for like rooms and travel and you yeah. know, a couple of tickets and stuff like that. But I didn't make money speaking, but mm. I was everywhere practicing, honing my skills of teaching the lessons and telling the stories. And then, you know, Guys like Forbes and Entrepreneur rank me top speaker in the world. I started my my first brand was uh, I'm the top motivational speaker you've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. That's great. And I know you were just mentioning uh, the book a little bit. G tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah. So this is my fourth book. I started with Connected to Goodness, uh, which was a bestseller, then Compassionate Capitalism. And then Jack Canfield from Chicken Soup for the Soul and I wrote a pamphlet nice. uh, for, for Unstoppable Foundation called Unstoppable, Create the Life You Love. This is my first published, like McGraw-Hill, big time book. 
it's called game time decision making. And what I did, because I'm a big believer in lessons, yep. is I took the lessons and I broke it down into a pregame analysis so I could tell people what I'm going to teach. Then I use all these killer sports stories that I've experienced from running Lee Steinberg, the most notable sports agency, yep. to sports one marketing, to having the playbook and elevate all the things I've learned. I'm using like superstars, you know, and John Wooden and just un the owners like Fertitta wrote my forward, you know, just yeah. great entrepreneurs that own sports teams. Mm -hmm. And so you got the pregame analysis. Then you got all these sports stories to teach the lessons using the greatest names in sports and business. Then I give a postgame analysis to go ahead and kind of coordinate and clarify what was taught by those stories. And it's really made for a fantastic best-selling book. And it's really clear. One of the things I believe I am is a transcoder. Like I understand highly complex, pragmatic and spiritual things. And I can put them down to like sim simple things like, you know, be a student of your calendar or do it now or, or these simple pragmatic ways yep. to encompass the continuum of the conscious, subconscious and unconscious mind. And that's really what the game time decisions are is understanding consciously, subconsciously and unconsciously your value so that you can evaluate things quickly and correctly to maximize your potential. Yep. That's really as easy as it is. And I go through a very simple step by step process to do that and tell really cold sports stories to teach it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. I'm excited to, uh, to check it out. I'm going to, I want to get the hard copy so that we could just put it in the, uh, you know, in, in like, hold down your papers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we could put it in the front uh, of, the, of the lobby of our office. And then I want the audio copy so I can listen to the auto copy when I'm working out. <laughs> I, oh my God. I did the audio myself. Okay, yeah, cool. That's I even better. I always yeah, like it when the, yeah, yeah, that's great. Talk about e of evolution. This is important because you talk about evolution. I'm consistently, my, my goal in life is to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential, whatever it may be. Yeah. That's an evolutionary goal, right? I believe my life is an evolution, not a revolution. And I'm reading my audio book. The book has been done, right? And they have me do it myself. And because I'm evolving, half of the book I'm reading, I'm like, oh, I could have, there's you're, so much making, more I could have said. You're making edits. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could. It was driving me nuts. Yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> like The guy so recording it kept on laughing at me because I'm like, oh my God, this isn't true like, anymore. You're like, you can't change it. Not true <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. So tell us a little bit about um, Sports One Marketing Agency. Tell us a little bit about what you guys do. I think it's pretty funny because, you know, Warren Moon is like the, the goat of quarterbacks and just, you yeah. know, and then you're like the goat of, 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 you know, speaking and business and stuff. So you guys probably make an amazing team. Yeah, we're kind of like Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> nice. I won't tell you who represents Danny DeVito. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but we're blessed. You know, it's funny because we both were partners with Lee Steinberg, uh, one of the greatest sports minds of all time, yeah. one of the greatest sports lawyers of all times. They actually did make the movie Jerry Maguire based on, on Lee, him. and they, Cram and Crow followed him around. He's the real deal. He's the GOAT. Yep, he right? is. And yep. so we, learned, we both learned from the GOAT, and – Warren and I spun off a marketing company. Specifically, what we decided was we don't want to represent the athletes and celebrities. We want to use them as the bug lights to attract making a lot of money to help a lot of people and have a lot of fun. So everything we do has the greatest names in sports that we don't represent yep. at the Super Bowl, the Pro Bowl, the Masters, Kentucky Derby, the Breeders' Cup, award shows like the ESPYs, Emmys, Oscars, Grammys, golf tournaments, but everything we do has killer celebrities and entertainers in it, all for the purpose of raising money for charity. Love it. And then having fun. So those list of things that I listed out, Warren and I basically sat down and said, hey, I love the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I love the Clemente family. I love the Super Bowl. You know, I love the ESPY Awards. Yeah. Like the Kids' Choice Awards I love. So let's do something there to raise money, bringing in all of the great people that we've earned you know, credible relationships with, and let's inspire people at these things. And we can make money along the way. Look, I have a purely 100% distribution. You know, my money, every penny I make, and I make a lot of money, I'm gonna make more money, unapologetic, yep. by the way, I love to <laughs> receive. Yes, because I give it to my wife, I give it to my kids, <laughs> I give it to my mom, I give it to my family, I give it to my company, I give it to my community, and I give it to the world. I'm the chief chancellor of Junior Achievement University, almost all the books that I sell through these different things go to 
donate stuff to Junior Achievement University, Unstoppable Foundation, all my coaching. I go ahead and donate my first month to the Unstoppable Foundation. I'm the chairman of that. We build schools in Africa and water and financial literacy and, oh, my God, healthcare, all the things. That's Thousands awesome. Of people. I, Great I, work. I, my 50th birthday, I did 50 parties around the world, around the world to raise money. I built two community centers in Africa. So I will tell you this, the, the real general lesson of my life, number one, I believe that money bought happiness. Mm -hmm. And I had proof that it did. I literally, I bought my mom a house and a car and I've never been happier in my life, right? Yeah. Nine mm -hmm. months out of law school, I paid off my law loans. Money's allowed me to do all kinds of cool stuff. Stuff I, some of it I should have done, shouldn't I should have done. But where I really learned my lesson is money, money is super important. It is the currency of our world. Yep. Meaning it's the energy, the object of energy that you put into the flow to get what you want. So if you have a green card, you can get just enough on Amazon. If you have a platinum card, you can get more, more. But if you have a black card, you can get everything for yep. everyone. Yep, I hear <laughs> same you. Thing with, same thing with faith, yep. right? Faith is, a, is an object of energy that you put into the flow, but there's an Amazon in the universe called the quantum field, the, the field of intention. And if you shop with faith, green card faith, you'll just have enough. If you shop with platinum card hmm. faith, you'll have you know, enough for you. But if you shop with black card faith, man, you could end up like Bezos. You can end up with anything more than enough of everything for everyone. And I learned one thing. Money does not buy happiness, but it allows you to shop the yep. same way that faith allows you to shop. And if you shop for the right things, if you put faith into the right things, you will be so happy. I promise you. Right. So yeah. don't have a problem receiving. The number one piece of advice I have for people is ask, ask, do you know anyone that can help me? Most people have a thousand people that they know now. Yeah. Right. Yep. If you ask them, do you know anyone that can help me? It's inclusive of them. But statistically, your network will grow minimum by one person a day asking 30,000 people a month. 360,000 people a year. In 10 years, it's 3.6 million people. Even if you are statistically unsuccessful, you're going to be successful. Imagine if you ask 10 people a day or 20 people a day. Yeah, what it, goes the back to, do. it goes back to what you were saying before with how you worked, you know, how you outworked everybody with inside of there. If you're going to ask more than other people, you're going to build your network faster, you know, in a faster it, amount of time. And when I ask, I'm always of service, right? That's yeah. the coolest thing. I create a flow. The giving is easy. Everybody, you know, people talk about why. Yeah. I think the why is BS because everybody's why is the same. They want to help. Yep. Right. You, you put, I want to help blank. And now you filled out everybody's why. Where people are chicken shit, excuse my language. No, I love it. Is they're, afraid, <laughs> they're afraid to know their what they want and ask for it. And then they're afraid, even more importantly, to ask for help on how to get it. Yep. Those mm -hmm. are, that's where people fail. Quit being a wimp. Yep. Ask what you want and then ask somebody to help you get it. Yep. And then when you get it, you can help more people because then you can give it away. You can't give what you don't yeah, have. Yep. Have mm -hmm. more. Yep. Mm -hmm. Love it, man. Love it. I, it's just an awesome message. You're getting me fired up. Yeah, over I'm, here, ready, man. I'm ready to go. That's it's awesome. Randall Cunningham behind you we're, is fired up. <laughs> we're gonna, yeah, we're going to hit the phones hard <laughs> for some sales calls when we get out of here. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, that's just awesome. I love the way that you just kind of laid that out. I never really heard of it like that. And I think that's, that's really cool. So who are some of the entrepreneurs that that you look up to um and that you follow with inside of the industry if you could touch on those so i have some old school ones that a lot of people don't know that built the basis or foundation in fact i was blessed wgn just did a tv show called world's greatest motivators and i got to be around some of these people yep. bob proctor mm -hmm. right yep. napoleon hill before that i read him yep. napoleon hill, bob proctor les brown yep. uh you know mary morrissey uh, you know, people, the old school, Blaine Bartlett, uh, mm -hmm. World Business Council, great business advisor. But then, you know, that's where the great ideas come from. And I think a lot of the social media people, they're missing, you know, uh, Brian Tracy is another one. Yep. David Corbin. There's there's the traditional guys that don't put their stuff up because they don't know how. Yeah. And then then what I did is I partnered with the best on the other side. Right. The, the Gary Vaynerchuks. Yeah. You know, to, to teach me how to capture amplify 
and perpetuate the content that I learned from the greatest minds on earth. The guys, you know, Bob Proctor's 85 years old. Yeah. Me, me and Gary Vaynerchuk together could not hold on a pencil the amount of knowledge that guy has about being an entrepreneur, yeah. let alone Napoleon Hill. Right. I go to the Napoleon Hill Foundation. I went there to help me write my books. I read Napoleon Hill every day like it's a Bible yep. because I want to know the traditional, the actual content. And then I need real experts like Gary to teach me how to capture, amplify and perpetuate that. Shakespeare said it years and years ago. Right. The world is your stage. Never before has it been more true that the world is your stage. Everything you can do can help inspire and empower and teach people. Just grab your phone or have a guy follow you around with a camera and you can do unbelievable things to help the world. Yeah, now's the time. Now's the time. Everybody is almost Build on even, even playing field. So um, I know Chase always likes to ask. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I lo typically like, because we're kind of coming to the end here, uh, I was going to ask you if you had like two or three tips for young entrepreneurs who are either trying to start a business or trying to get into, you know, the agency or the industry that you're in. Yeah, absolutely. So no, number one is look at acceleration and growth. Don't look at the outcome. So if you're trying to get into the industry, right, the, the hard part for entrepreneurs and for people getting in the industry is they start, you know, let's say at 18, by the time, you know, they're 30, they're only 25% of the way there and 99% of them quit. Mm -hmm. But if they were focused on the acceleration and growth, they would realize that by the time they're 36, right, six years later from the yep. 12, yep. they'd be 50% of the way there. And then of the 1% that hang on, 99% of those guys quit. And the saddest thing is at 39, they'd be 100% of the way there. So if they put faith in everyone else telling them they're a loser and all these things, they got to get married and buy a house and they can't live, you know, the way they're living. Yep. Well, at 39, they're the ones that are lucky. They're yeah. overnight successes, right? Overnight mm -hmm. successes after 11, you know, tw it's just so frustrating. The number two thing is be, I mean, you've got to ask, right? Like I'm telling you, if you're young, ask for help. Old geezers like me love to help young people. Yeah. All you have to do is, hey, do you know anyone can help me get a job with the Dodgers? You know anyone can help me with starting a company, building my brand, doing a podcast, writing a book? Ask, 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 ask. Find the guy that you want to be like that sits in the situation that you're in or woman and ask for help. The last thing is you got to be a student of your calendar. You got to study your calendar, the time that you're spending with a lens of productivity and accessibility, right? We have 24 hours a day. You got to study it. Don't look at it. Be more interested than interesting. Study your calendar and make sure that if you can do something now, you do it now. If you can't, put it in a do it now folder, prioritize by what's important first, delegate what's urgent and not important. Do what's important first. If you do things now, you save at minimum twice as much time and exponentially you're more successful. Those are the simple tips that I give young entrepreneurs. So please be kind to your future self and do good deeds and everything will come your way at the right way at the perfect time. Perfect. Perfect. What a way to end it. That's Thanks so perfect, much, David. Man. Hey, David, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Uh, love watching you. Love watching your career. Can't wait to see what's coming up next. Um, Chase is going to go ahead and uh, close us out, give all the information about your book and your handles and everything and our handles as well. Go ahead. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. And if you're looking to learn more about David Meltzer, you can visit his website, www.davemeltzer.com and find him on Twitter at David Meltzer. It's the same handle for Instagram. Uh, you could search him on Facebook, buy his new book, Game Time Decision Making on Amazon. Um, it's awesome. I can't wait to crack into it. David, thanks so much for, for joining us on the podcast today. It was great having you. Um, and for all of our listeners, if you want to find out more about the Mac Talks, how to watch, listen, subscribe, you could visit our website, www.themactalks.com. Uh, leave us a review on iTunes. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at M-A-C-K Talks. Uh, you can give Scott and I a follow as well. And that's it. David, thank you so yeah. much, man. You're awesome. Man. They got to hook up. I'm in New York all the time. I'll be there Wednesday, Thursday this week. So if you guys are in the city ever, let me know. Awesome, awesome man. Thank Let's you. Do it. Thanks. Take, Take care. Awesome. Wow. What a great guest. David was. Lots of insight. Can't wait to see that book. I'm all fired up. I'm excited. And uh, so we're going to roll it right into our favorite part of the show, which is... Mac move or whack move. Topic one. That's right. What do we got here? My favorite part. You don't have a sign. Sweet. Prepped. All right. So 
start off there, Chase. What do we got? Topic number one. Topic topic number one. Fortnite millionaire. I'm sure you guys have heard about this kid. Um, he's making a lot of parents mad. I know that because now he's got all the kids believing that they're going to be major league gamers and make millions Dude, of dollars. Kyle, what's his name? Kyle Gearsdorf. Uh, people, he goes by the name Booga. Triumphed over 99 other players in the inaugural, which means the first Fortnite World Cup held at Arthur Ashe Stadium in New York's Flushing Meadows. Um, and he won how much money? $3 million. Wow. Good for this young fella. Uh, he is the Michael Jordan of video games, right? Like, that's probably what he is at this point. Uh, he Not the Michael Jordan, but he's definitely like like a like a Dwayne Wade or like a... Uh, LeBron James, maybe. Well, he, he's, uh, he's got to win more than one World Cup to be like LeBron James, yeah, right? He's got to so. win a couple in a row. He's the, he's the, he's the Michael Jordan of 16-year-olds. Well, well, that's the reason why I, you know, you're a little... He's the Michael Jordan of 16-year-olds. All right, so you're a young fella. So I feel like I need to take it back to educate you as to why I said that. So like before Michael Jordan won anything and he came onto the scene, it was like, damn, like everybody was just blown away by his look, his shorts, Mm -hmm. the fact that he was a high flyer, the fact Mm -hmm. that he was cutting edge. That's what I was trying to say when I said that. So, So sorry for stuttering, but that's why I said that. So still don't see how it translates to this kid, but uh, yeah, I mean because the, he's the first he's one. Great. To really yeah, like, yeah, you but know. no, but there's been gaming anyway. He he's got a lot of parents mad, and apparently he's doing everything. He's doing he t- he does lessons. He does training in the morning. Oh, I love it. He's like an athlete. He's like an athlete. I mean, he trains I for hours and hours and hours. I'm gonna go Mac move. Yeah. even though I know the parents are parents are upset. Yeah, parents I mean, this is almost like an obvious Mac move. Right. Because, I mean, everybody wins here. Uh, You know, the kid wins the money makes he's opening up a new industry for people to get involved in. I think any time a new industry gets opened up, it's good for the economy. Good for the American. But also, he's not the first kid to ever win money playing video games as well. No. Right. I mean, there are kids that play Madden. And that yeah, win money. FIFA, all the all of them. Yeah. yeah. What's minimum wage on video games? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're gonna go on to topic number two. All right. Topic number two. This one's really interesting. This one's very strange. Uh, Kanye West uh, is. <laughs> <laughs> Kanye West is being ordered by um, the city of Calabasas to stop work on. Star Wars inspired affordable housing. Uh, he's been working on this project for a while, and just recently his neighbors started to complain that he's doing things without permits. Rich people are pissed off. Yeah. I like the cause behind what he's doing, but don't piss off your neighbors, dude. Like, don't piss off your neighbors. He's going like full Elon Musk, and he hasn't even, like, he's never invented anything, you know? He's just creative, he's a creative guy. And he's, but he's going I like, like the full cause, Elon. I like the, I like like what, like the meaning behind what he's doing, but it's also like, you can't just, I mean, it, it, it seems yeah, kind of cultish to be honest with you. If you're going to build, I don't even know where the Star Wars does, thing comes in. It does, it does. I have no effing clue why he's building them like the Star Wars igloo, igloos, right? Yeah. That's what he's doing. Why? I don't know. It's cool though because remember in the the first Star Wars episode, like they show you the inside of one of those houses, yeah. and it goes like underground, and they're like, in, it's I sick. highly doubt that it's cool. It also think if you guys have seen um, his fashion uh, designs and stuff, I really think aesthetically this housing, the color palettes, the earth tones, everything that has to go with it, it matches up with his design and his brand, like his clothing. Okay. I, I, I don't know what that has to do with it, but it, it Well, I would like this. Creative. This is what I would like. I would like for the Kardashians to do an episode on this shit. That's what I want to see. <laughs> I want to see Chris Jenner out there in them igloos. You know what I want to see? Hmm. An Elon Musk, Kanye West collaboration. Elon Musk wouldn't, wouldn't waste his time with Kanye West. He <sighs> wouldn't do it. I'm going to go w- whack move. He would. I like what you're doing. But ultimately what you're doing is you're just wasting a shitload of money because I'm sure he's been served a cease and assist to stop building, right? So I like what you're doing. I like the concept of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. But can you please do it the right way the so it can be sustained? Yeah. That's the reason why I'm going yeah. whack move. Okay. And also, you know, I'm not really down with those the, the, the concept that he went with. Okay. I would have preferred maybe something a little more, I don't know, like the Amazon tiny houses. 
Yeah. Because then when it doesn't work, you just pull them away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Like, come on. Kai, okay. Come on. What are you doing? All right. Uh, definitely going 100% whack move on this. Uh, love Star Wars. Uh, love. Real, you have the sign the wrong way? I meant Mac move. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, lo Mac move. Sorry, guys. Uh, love Star Wars. Love Kanye West. I'd like, honestly, I'd live in one of these houses if I could just have it to myself and don't got to share it with like six or seven bros. Um, You'd have to. But just, anyway. hey, hey, let's get these cleared with the city before you start building, you know, shit in your, on your property. Let's Maybe get you should have the Maybe bros. Maybe get the permit. Maybe you should have the bros. What are they called? The dudes? Um, JT Parr. JT Parr and, and, and uh, uh, Chad. Chad Kroger. Yeah, Chad Kroger. Be like, hey, council, Kanye wants to put in a permit to build these igloos, man. Those guys get shit done. They do. They get shit done. When it comes to municipalities, they get things done, those dudes. <laughs> we got to get those bros on the show. I know. We got to get those bros on the show. I know. Talk about community leaders. Yeah. All right. Topic three. Topic number three is uh, Nike receives flack for plastic pollution after their new shoe called the Nike Joy, Ro Joy Rides uh, debuts. So essentially... Um, an author from Gizmodo has a hit, a hit piece out on these shoes. They have these tiny little, what looks like plastic balls in the sole, mm. which makes it feel like you're running on sand. Um, it's easier on your joints, easier on your feet, makes you feel like you're, you know, you're not beating the hell out of your joints. Um, gotcha. so the shoe is supposed to benefit athletes, but they're saying that but they're being shamed, right? They're trying to shame. They're trying to shame Nike. Um, just to be clear, yeah, they're TPE beads. So there's these little beads that go in these pouches in the sole of the shoe. Mm. And uh, I get it. I mean, I don't I get, know. I get I, it. Like, I don't know. What happens with when when they go to like recycle these shoes, throw them away or whatever is going to happen? These they beads recycle never. The plastic. Don't they recycle the plastic? Also, dude, think about this fish. Like they're gonna be swallowing these up and dying. It's gonna get in there, or or birds, Why? or any gonna, any. But is animal. someone gonna throw this thing in the ocean? How, how are they gonna get? But they're contained. How are they gonna get recycled? Oh, you know what? You know what? I'm not the first one, and this guy is not the first one to criticize this technology. Also, the same technology is used in body scrubs and toothpastes. So you know, like the see that I see is a bigger problem because it's constantly used. Yeah. Is this called pumice? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I know what pumice is. See, so that actually concerns me a little more because it's constantly being used. But I don't know. I tell you what, though. Who was it that came out with the shoes that were recycled? Adidas? Uh, yeah, I think yeah, so. They're, Nike's yeah. on the wrong side of this. Yeah. They're on the wrong side of this. I mean, the only way this could go any worse is if they came out with a pair of plastic beaded shoes that were that were Colin Kaepernick shoes. That's the only time <laughs> it could actually be worse. If you want to hit all the source, hit all, get everybody who's butthurt about these issues. We just <laughs> get them all, knock them all out in one. So I don't know. Maybe we got to do a product review if they're if they're if they're cool enough and they got that the cushioning. That is way outside of our budget on product reviews. Well, we don't even These know how much they are, cost. Uh, they're Nikes, and they, they it makes it look like you're they makes you feel like you're running on sand. I'm going a buck thirty minimum. Yeah, gotta be at least they're Nikes. Oh, let's they're be probably honest. two hundred bucks. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We're not doing no. Unless we send them back, we just go down to Bob's. Is Bob still in business? I don't know. Hmm. What are we going to do here? What are you going to go with? Um, I am going to go with that. It's a it's a whack move that they're being policed like this. I don't yeah. foresee it being that big of a deal. Yeah, I yeah. guarantee you there's probably a shit ton of plastic on those shoes anyway. Um, I don't know. So I'm going to go whack move on the fact that people are trying to shit on Nike about this. And I don't really care about the shoes. Okay. That's my stance uh, on this. I'm going to go with, um, yeah, I'm going to go with uh, you really Mac think move. about that, huh? Mac move, yeah, because really for a second I was like, that. listen, I think that they think sh Nike the should be, yeah, I do. I do. I think it's bad for the environment. We don't need this. We don't need this. This is just going to choke up little fishies and kill them. Bro, I don't, I, I don't know. What there's about no the rest way of the, the shoe, There's though, no like, way to like recycle these. Okay, so then like, let me ask you this question. When are they coming for the ball pits? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> when the, are these sons of bitches coming for our ball pits? I don't know, but that's next, and and I support that as well. Ball pits are useless. They're usually, just ball a pits, great way to as a child get hurt. As a child, ball pits were 
so amazing. You didn't, you experienced electronics and cool shit when you were a kid. Me, I didn't experience that. So like ball pits were where it was at. Chuck E. Cheese, Chuck E. Cheese on them back when I was eight years old, nine God years old. God knows what diseases you'll catch if you jump in one of those. God knows what's going know. on in those ball pits. You can't see underneath them. I don't know. But I'm just saying, they're coming for the ball pits. They're, yeah. Um, they are. Whack move. This is bad for the environment. Nike, step it up. All right. Next topic. But it's, it's weird because I went whack move that they were being shamed because of it. And you went whack move based upon the shoe. That's kind of... It's almost like we don't know what the hell we're doing here. All right. It's like we're. It's like we don't know what we're doing. This is an open. It's. It's. There's very simple rules. Mac move or whack move. Topic four. I like this one. This one hits me. This one hits me. All right. I'm gonna. Can you actually? Can you actually explain this no, one? No, you're the moderator, bro. All right. Because you 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 seem like you're really passionate about this, and you know you know the rules of the NBA. Anyway, here's this. Here's the scoop. It's not NBA. Here's the scoop. Go ahead. Um. So. Agent Rich Paul, he's a sports agent, um, calls NCAA's Rich Paul rule harmful and exclusionary. He's talking about a new uh, provision in an NCAA rule that says that to, in order to be a sports agent for the NCAA, um, for an NCAA athlete, you have to have four years of college experience or col you have to have a college degree. You have to go to college for four years. You got to graduate. You got to get a degree in order to represent. That's a goddamn whack move. Okay. You only need a college degree if when you're operating on somebody or maybe in the court of law. And I get it. Some scientist shit too, whatever. But yeah. you're going to be an agent. Are you serious? Yeah. To be an agent. Yeah. Really? Really? What courses are you going to take? How to? I don't even understand anyway because Rich Paul gets these guys after anyway. Like he didn't have, he didn't have Antonio Davis. He got Antonio. He doesn't need to go into college. He doesn't need to get those guys coming out of college. They will come to him yeah. after. So, I mean, that is the biggest whack move. I have such a problem with that. The NCAA is just, they're, they're such bullshit. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I'm not down with it. I I mean, what classes is this guy going to take? Let's talk about what kind of classes would, would a sports agent take in college? Yeah, they want you to have a. What, what time are the have? games on? So she. What time? What time are so the NFL? What time's NFL prime time? What if time? he graduated from school <laughs> for graphic design and he has a degree? But I'm sure they want a specific type of uh, associate's degree. Is what they probably want to see. But I mean, that's bullshit. Well, that, they want more than an associate. An associate's is two years. They want a four year. They want a four year. Full, yeah, they want you you to have your your bachelor's degree. That's some bullshit. Yeah. So, um, I'm yeah. Look, definitely. he's got LeBron. I'm gonna go with Rich Paul. If I'm gonna bet on which which one of these is gonna work in their favor, I'm gonna say the NCAA yeah. probably helped Rich Paul by doing this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. come on now. No, I'm I'm going with Scott Whack move. You, you you should have to have a degree to be a doctor or a lawyer or something that actually requires you to you know have qual qualifications. This is something like just like sales or. Or, or marketing, like, you don't need to do. The thing that I think is real funny is that the NCAA has no problem using athletes, and they don't give a shit about them getting a degree, right? So they have guys that come in that are one and done, right? That's a good point. They don't care about those guys having degrees, but they can use them to make their money, right? Because they want to make their money. So they're like, oh, no, 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 that's cool. We don't need this guy doesn't need a degree, right? That's a great point. Thank you. Hypocritical. Thank you. Hypocritical. Hypocritical. The NCAA is the definition yeah. of hypocritical. Yeah. They really are. They yeah. suck. And everybody knows that. They do. They do. All right. All right. Uh, last topic of the day. ASAP Rocky. So uh, U.S. Uh, warned Sweden um, of negative consequences if ASAP Rocky was not released from the prison uh, cell that he was being kept. Did they in. warn him they like saying like that, thug rappers would would, would would warn other thug rappers? And I <laughs> listen. This could Did have been say, a trade thing. Don't mess with like, your we boy. We won't trade with you. Don't if mess you, with your boy. Yeah, basically, uh, you know how you know. I told you uh, Kanye West, and you definitely heard Kanye West and uh, uh, President Trump teamed up for this endeavor, and they got him out. And uh, yeah, and now he's going to be staying in the igloo. Yeah, Kanye's backyard. Yeah, so. And we saw the video. ASAP Rocky didn't do anything. I think he was wrongfully um, in prison. I think Sweden's trying to make an example out of him, saying that you know you can't just come to our country and leech off of our our audiences here. But I don't understand. Sweden is really weird too. Like you don't get a trial or what is it? 
How does it work? Yeah, you, you're just guilty. You go straight to the to scare, right? It's a scare tactic. So yeah. instead, so if you get charged with something, you go right to prison, no matter what. Not j or you go to jail. You don't go to prison. So have you ever seen so my favorite right to, my favorite program? It's called uh, and stop sticking your hand in front of my camera, bro. Just stop it. But my favorite my favorite show is Locked Up Abroad. Locked Up Abroad, ASAP Rocky edition. Huh? That's would be a call fire your boy, episode. Call your boy who's going to call your boy. And your boy is Kanye. And he's going to call your boy. And that's his boy, which is Donald Trump. So now a bunch of Come celebrities, performers are, are boycotting Sweden saying like they're never going to perform there. You know? I would suggest they be very careful Snoop there. Snoop Dogg being one of them. Kanye, I believe, also obviously says that he won't go there and perform anymore. So what, would, what did we say? You mess with our rappers, we're going to... We're gonna drop tariffs on you. Yeah, if you wrongfully imprison our 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 performers, like then you yeah. love our performers, we're gonna put tariffs on them. Yeah, you want to buy the CD? You got tariffs. Yep, nobody's buying CDs. Well, they so hey, it was successful. And honestly, if you told me, if you if I told you ten years ago that Donald Trump would be collaborating with Kanye West to try and break ASAP Rocky out of a Swedish prison, you would look at me like I had nine heads. I would. It's stupid. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It's crazy the world we're living in here. I don't even know what we're voting on here. What are we going with? Like, um, I'm going with... Is this whole... Is getting... If it's bullshit... Is the then U.S. pressuring Sweden to release ASAP right. Rocky? Because he didn't do move. really anything that wrong, I guess I'm going to go Mac move. Although, if he did do something really wrong, I would have a problem with them doing that. But I saw the video. I don't think that what he did was, like, warranted that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not like he assault, he didn't assault anybody really. Nobody really got hurt. And the worst part about this is the people that were inciting this violence, those two guys that were following him around, didn't go to prison. Like they didn't get anything. Like That's they bullshit. don't even know they're not even residents of Sweden. That's bullshit. So why? Where are those guys? Yeah, where are they? Get them. All right, that concludes this round of Mac move or whack move. Uh, and this actually is the end of our episode, which is episode what? 33? 33, it should be. Yeah. <sighs> wow. A lot of episodes. We had an awesome guest, man. I love that dude. I can't wait to listen to that book. I know. I, I hope we get to meet wait. him too. We really do have to get the book. Sign copy. Can we get up with him? I'm going to send my boy Parker a message. I'll tell you what. You got Gary V's text, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to see Gary. He's going to see Gary. Shoot him a message. Be like, hey, we'll come see you at the, at the Daily V. Mac Talks, Gary V, David Meltzer. See how Meltzer. we could do that? See, we could do a little something, something, something. Two get for a one signed special. Book. Get a signed book. So, all right. all right, cool. So that concludes this episode. Chase, why don't you go ahead and uh, close us out? Give people our handles. Tell them to leave us reviews and all that good stuff. All right. So uh, as always, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen, for this episode of the Mac Talks. And if you're looking to learn more about David, you can visit his website, www.dave.com. Meltzer, M-E-L-T-Z-E-R.com and find him at David Meltzer on Twitter and Instagram. Search him on Facebook. Buy his latest book, Game Time Decision Making, on Amazon. It's supposed to be a hell of a ride. David, um, it was awesome having you on the podcast. For all of our listeners, if you want to find out more about the Mac Talks, how to listen, watch, and subscribe, you can visit our website, www.themactalks.com. If you like our content, please leave us a review on iTunes. Every review makes a big difference. Leave that Support review. the show. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. Look, guys, we got to keep the lights on here. Okay. Yeah. Someone's got to pay the bills. Yeah. All right. And not that reviews pays the bills because they it, don't. It will. But eventually it will. It will. It will. So uh, you could also give uh, Scott and I a follow. I, I I haven't done this in a while. So uh, at Scotty underscore content underscore and at Chase underscore Hutchison underscore. Like, next time subscribe comment like subscribe comment see you guys next time thank you very much bye bye